Good afternoon and welcome to our second FBF online seminar of this academic year. My name is Pierre Schlosser. I'm the scientific coordinator of the Florence School of Banking and Finance. And it is a real pleasure for me to, to welcome you to today's online seminar on financial stability and insurance markets. I'm very glad to welcome our two speakers of today, Francesco Mazzafero from the European Systemic Risk Board, where he's head of the Secretariat. Buongiorno, Francesco. And Dimitris Zafiris from the European Insurance and Occupational Pension Authority, where he's head of the Risks and Financial Stability Department. Dimitris Kalimera. Uh, Francesco and Dimitris, you are live streaming from Frankfurt. Um, I will not present your respective biographies exhaustively as they are available on our website. You have both extensive professional experience in the field of banking and finance, both in the public and the private sector. I'd like also at this stage to thank my colleague Jan, who has prepared the seminar and is managing our online platform as we speak. So today's online seminar will focus, as you know, on the regulatory framework and risks in the insurance sector. I think it's fair to say that insurance companies make less headlines than banking groups. It doesn't mean, however, that they carry no risks and are subject to no regulation. Quite on the contrary, I'm therefore very grateful for the availability sorry, of Francesco and Dimitris to help us debunk those myths and guide us through the jungle of insurance regulation and supervision. I'm looking forward also personally to learn a lot today. Before telling you more about our expert audience, I would like to inform you about our school's upcoming activities. Uh, some of them indeed I think will be of interest to you uh, and to your organizations. So as you may know, since its creation in 2016, our school has been training more than 2,300 participants coming from 70 countries and a variety of organizational backgrounds. Trained institutions, to give you an example, include uh, the European Central Bank, it includes also the Bank of Spain, the Central Bank of Ireland, the Portuguese Financial Markets Authority, the Bank of Korea. Um, and looking ahead, we have a series of courses lined up over the next months, which uh, could be of interest. So we'll have a quantitative course on macroprudential policy on the 23rd and to the 25th of September with Professor Enrique Mendoza from the University of Pennsylvania. Most importantly for this audience, we'll have a course also on prudential risks and policies in the European insurance sector with instructors from IOPA, the ESRB, and the National Bank of Belgium, including also with Francesco and Dimitris. Also, in later earlier in October, we'll host a course on valuation in derivative markets with Professor MacDonald from Kellogg School of Management in, in the US and Fabrizio Planta from ESMA here in Europe. Uh, as a general recommendation, uh, do not wait for the last moment if you'd like to attend our courses uh, and be guaranteed the seat. So you can find more detail on all our activities on our website, um, but also since a few months on our LinkedIn page, which has now several hundreds of followers, and where you'll be able to keep track of the school weekly podcast and receive periodic information on our numerous activities. So do have a look on our LinkedIn page next time you're, you're there. Okay, so I guess it's time to thank you for your patience and introduce you to one another. Since you don't see each other, it's always helpful to uh, do the presentations here from Florence. So as we speak, you are around 70, uh, 75 participants connected today, following us from almost everywhere in Europe and from several other continents. 41 nationalities are represented. We are very, very glad to count on several participants from uh, uh, law firm CMS, from the Reserve Bank of South Africa, from the European Central Bank as always, as well as from other uh, authorities, law firms, and private banks. But of course, let me welcome everyone uh, to, this, to this seminar. Uh, Gender-wise, we have 54% of women, 46% of men. You have about 8.5 years of professional experience on average. And this time, 48% of you are trained economists, 21% are lawyers, and 15% have a background in business. Lastly, 68% of you have a master's degree, while 21% of you have a PhD and 11% a bachelor degree. So right, I think it's uh, time to start. We'll, um, we'll proceed in the following way. 
Francesca and Dimitris will speak for about 25 to 30 minutes maximum. Their talk will be uh, supported by three polls, which will appear on your screen for you to fill in at the very end of their presentation. And then following the polls, we'll open up the Q&A session where you participants will have a chance to write your questions, as always, or comments, that's fine too, in the chat box, which will appear, it's not appearing now, but it will appear when we open the Q&A session at the bottom of your screen. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'll stop here and I will uh, appear again for the Q&A. Uh, so I leave the floor to Frankfurt, um, Francesco and uh, Dimitris, if you could just connect your camera and microphone and share them with the platform. So these are two different different steps. And Perfect. I am here, so we... I'm delighted to be with, uh, with Dimitris uh, uh, Zaferis. Uh, I'm physically hosted by the EOPA, <laughs> which is also a sign of how much we have been working, yeah. working together. Um, we are presenting to you uh, in an introductory form the content of what we are going to, to present on the 17th and 18th of October in, in Florence. Let me say, uh, by the way, uh, as a, as a, also to, to create some interest in this topic, that in these days uh, with uh, negative interest rates being becoming really very important in the markets, uh, the topic which we are discussing is does not belong to theory. Uh, anymore, in the sense that, that uh, uh, the question of uh, financial stability in insurance is a topic which is discussed. Uh, myself, I'm going to speak about this the day after tomorrow here in, in, in Frankfurt. Uh, so I'm, I must say that compared to what was the discussion a few years ago when people were uh, basically arguing on this question in theoretical terms, now we are really confronted with uh, an, interesting, an interesting interaction between policymakers and uh, uh, industry and, uh, uh, and the public, the public uh, at large. Now, just to tell you what is the structure of uh, our presentation, uh, we will try to, to discuss uh, very shortly uh, what is uh, the uh, the, the way in which uh, insurance can contribute to systemic risk. We say contribute because we are acutely aware uh, that uh, insurance has a special position here. It is uh, very often not the source of, uh, of uh, systemic risk by itself, but it can uh, basically be an amplifier and a transmitter of, uh, of a systemic risk. Nevertheless, we should look at this with great care because we are in, in, in a phase in which uh, financial markets are probably very far from, uh, from an equilibrium. Then we will discuss about the, comprehensive, the need for a comprehensive regulatory framework. This is an important point because, as many of you may know, uh, the, uh, the legislation which is guiding uh, a regulation on insurance in Europe, which is called Solvency II, it's a directive for all those which are outside Europe. It means that, that if it sets the rules and then it has to be implemented at, at national level. Uh, this Solvency II directive uh, is a subject to, to a review in the next years. And so we want, so to speak, to ensure that as a part of the review, there will be also a macro, a macro prudential chapter. Uh, then we will go, uh, and this will be done by, by my, my colleague, uh, friend Dimitris, we will go into very specific issues which are, however, super important. One is the need to have a recovery and resolution regime. Uh, this is particularly important in, in bumpy times like we are today uh, in, in financial, financial markets. And of course, an insurance guarantee scheme which is a way uh, to take care of the concern of, uh, of the people and uh, policy order. Now, to not to have the things uh, too uh, abstract, it's important to, to, to know that failure belongs to the life uh, of, uh, of insurance. Uh, so we have been uh, now identifying two cases uh, which, which uh, maybe are, are not in the radar screen of financial stability uh, policy makers, which are mostly occupied with, uh, with banks. But should not be forgotten. So one real case is what happened uh, in, in Belgium during the years of uh, crisis. This, 
is an episode of the big Dexia uh, problem uh, when a key player in Belgium uh, suffered basically a, a run. Now, normally, one of the things which you are told is that insurance runs do not exist. Now, this is a case in which an insurance run took place. Of course, this is also very much depending upon the legal framework uh, which exists uh, in, in the countries. Now, here, basically, uh, there were withdrawals. Uh, you see from the slides that the withdrawals were, were intense, were fast, and they basically uh, required uh, emergency support measure and the intervention, basically, of public authorities. The second uh, case is a very different one, but is uh, one which uh, should not uh, be ignored. It's the case of one of the largest uh, insurance corporation in Australia. Uh, well, what happened there is that basically the business model uh, of uh, this company, which was called HIH, was not functioning well. Uh, there was a severe problem of under-reserving and uh, under-pricing, which basically uh, led to a failure. And what happened there is that as they were having a, a monopoly in, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, their activities, uh, number, a number of activities could not be pursued anymore. In particular, suspend, uh, construction uh, was, was suspended. So imagine a situation in which a very big insurer or a very big reinsurer uh, would have so a monopolistic or a predominant position in a certain market, they would go bust. And at a certain time, what you discover is that uh, there is not a, a early or easy substitution, and basically the economy is is not uh, is not served anymore. Now, here, uh, this is the slides is of course to a certain extent very difficult, uh, perhaps even impossible uh, for you for you to read. I have the great advantage of having in front of me a, a larger version, which permits me uh, to have a look at this. But basically, if you conceptually try to say, uh, to repeat what I've been saying now, that what is the ATIAS case, the Belgian case, is a situation in, in which you have some vulnerabilities. These vulnerabilities uh, can be maturity mismatches, can be an investment portfolio which has poor uh, credit quality, there may be an inadequate uh, reinsurance structure. Um, now, in this situation, you can be hit uh, by a banking crisis, like for example, the case Dexia, uh, or by uh, a, a shock, uh, and then the, 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 the insurance uh, is uh, um, basically suffering uh, a, a, second, a second step shock, in this case is uh, the mass lapse, and uh, is basically amplifying and translate, is translating the, the vulnerability uh, across, uh, across the economy until basically uh, you have a situation in which you may have contagion. Uh, to, uh, to other uh, sectors. Now, uh, looking, and this was the, the part on the left uh, of, uh, of the slide, you may have uh, uh, on the right the HIH study, uh, where uh, you may have, uh, so to speak, uh, issues also here uh, linked to an inefficient uh, business model. Uh, which may be uh, amplified by the fact that they may have been uh, under pricing, under-reserving, so basically the money is not there, which is basically what can happen uh, if you have a combination of uh, uh, bad governance, bad, uh, bad decisions, and basically people having ignored reality for a long time. And then what happens is that if this insurance is uh, uh, servicing critical functions, these critical functions basically, uh, basically disappear. Now, what to do uh, in uh, in uh, such situations. Of course, we have been admittedly now presenting only wrong cases, and there are a lot of good cases. There are, there are insurance corporations which are doing extremely well also in these days uh, in which, so to speak, uh, the financial situation can be, uh, can be very adverse. But basically what we have to do is that we, we need a, a, basically a discussion, and, and this is what we are trying to do. It. We need to establish a culture even if you want, uh, of uh, uh, looking at insurance issues uh, in a, in a, in a forward-looking uh, and not only reactive, uh, reactive, uh, reactive way. And by the way, 
but both institutions uh, which are uh, represented today have been doing it. And what you see in the slide are a number of uh, reports. Uh, so we have to a certain extent a doctrine, if you want, a macroprudential doctrine of financial stability, uh, uh, which we have been serving uh, and we are feeding uh, uh, over the last uh, over the last uh, uh, over the last uh, months. Now, trying to understand what in practice we would like to propose, because at the very end, what we are doing is we are going, we will go to the legislator and we will go to society and, to, and saying that we need something which we do not have. What we need is a, a good combination of uh, uh, different pillars. Uh, so it's very important to understand that these problems cannot be uh, so, uh, solved by institution without having the capacity to address all the aspects of, of the weakness. Now we need certainly, we have, and we need to even strengthen a strong, a strong microprudential regulation and supervision. This is the sovereignty word, uh, sovereignty two word, uh, which we have of Europe, and in which I will say we are quite proud, uh, in the sense that, that Europe is uh, setting the scene at the international level uh, with a strong uh, microprudential regulation. We, we need a, a recovery and resolution regime, which we still do not have. Uh, we have it, in fact, in a, in a couple of countries. So we, we, we have it in France, we have it in the Netherlands, we have it in Romania. Uh, so there are a number of countries which have understood that there was the need of, of uh, taking these steps. In some of these countries also because uh, the, the, the government, like in the case of, of the Netherlands, had been called in the past uh, to put money to, to support uh, the insurance, insurance sector. We need uh, insurance guarantee schemes which would be, uh, so to speak, um, uh, helping uh, to compensate for losses in the event of uh, uh, these, uh, these insolvencies. Uh, and here, as, uh, as uh, um, Dimitris will explain, uh, also here we need to have political progress uh, in, 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 uh, in Europe. And what we need is a macroprudential policy which is going beyond the protection of uh, the individual insurers and which is able to deploy tools which uh, target systemic, uh, systemic risk. Now, to tell the truth, and this is important to say, part of the, of the solutions is already there in the sense that Solvency II, uh, even if it is uh, uh, aimed at, at looking at uh, solutions at the level of individual insurers, is already providing uh, some tools to us. So you may know that there is a symmetric adjustment for equity risk, which basically means that when, when there is a buoyant uh, equity uh, market, uh, insurance corporations uh, basically create a reserve which can be used in times in which uh, the equity market is, uh, is doing wrongly. Uh, there is also a volatility adjustment which is uh, targeting even if partially precipitous behavior. And there is a possibility to extend the recovery period in exceptionally adverse situations. We know that an intelligent use of forbearance uh, is a part of, of, the, of, uh, of the game, uh, provided this is done in full uh, knowledge and understanding of what are the situations and what are the rules, uh, the rules of the game. But of course, systemic risk cannot be addressed by microprudential regulation uh, alone, and this is the reason, and now I am basically going uh, to uh, the slide number 11, which is, uh, uh, I think, the point in which I will pass uh, uh, the, the floor to, uh, uh, to Dimitris, is basically to describe, even if uh, to a certain rapidly, what are the ideas we have in mind, what are the solutions which we would like to, to propose. So, first of all, we need uh, some instrument to look at phenomenon like mass lapses. So, so this is the ATIAS uh, uh, things which we have been discussing. We have to be, uh, we are in very procyclical economies and so we need to uh, be aware of the need of uh, addressing procyclicality. We are doing it by the way knowing that uh, insurance is very different from banks. So we are not proposing so to speak, bank-like instruments. We are trying to address this from an insurance-specific uh, perspective. 
we have to, uh, of course, be aware of the, the risk that uh, uh, sovereignty positions could be uh, weakened by economic shocks across, across the board. Um, underpricing and under-reserving could be a collective phenomenon, not only a, a specific uh, individual uh, phenomenon. And, uh, and of course, uh, well, I mean, here, when we are speaking of risky behaviors, well, we know that to a certain extent now, uh, the search for yield has become a completely prevailing, obviously, to a certain extent, phenomenon, I would say, uh, across the globe. Uh, it's one of, uh, of the, so to speak, of, uh, of the things which did not exist when we were studying at university, uh, and today, to a certain extent, is, is one of uh, the rules of the game, and has to, be at, has to be looked at with great, great attention. Now, the, what we are proposing uh, are a set of, uh, of tools, some of which are capital-based, so we are thinking of capital surcharges, of a, of a, of a structural uh, uh, nature. We are referring here also to dividend restriction. This is something which probably a number of companies would not like to hear. But if things go start to become miserable, it's very important to, to make sure that basically the, 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 the little money which is there is not simply distributed to, to the shareholders and remains there to defend the institution from possible shocks. We are thinking of possible intervention powers in exceptional circumstances in case of liquidity-based tools. So it's better to be paid, uh, the, the, let's say, the, the insurance uh, with some restrictions rather than simply to be in a situation in which the company is being broken and you, you don't get anything of this. So one has to be very clear in the sense that if worse comes to the worse, the alternative is either that there are instruments which are used uh, to, to impede the complete collapse uh, or, or simply the only thing which you can go is directly to go to the insurance uh, guarantee schemes. Uh, the, the narrative reporting is important. You need to create a culture in the institution which needs to be able to explain to the supervisor what the hell are they doing in the moment in which they are in uh, different, uh, difficult waters. And this has to mean, and this means also that these type of issues have to be discussed at the board level. Uh, very often what happens in these situations is that one discovers at past that weak governance is very much at, uh, at the root of, of problems. Recovery and resolution framework, we need to have the same type of preparations uh, for, so to speak, the funeral, if you want, uh, which you are organizing uh, for, uh, for, uh, for large banks, and you need to make sure it's not a third-class funeral, so there must be a good one. And then, of course, uh, in the moments in which the insurance is providing uh, credit or bank-like activities, and my dear friends, in some countries, this is not a small part of it. So we have some countries where we have among one-third and uh, one-half of new credit which is provided by insurance. Well, basically, we have to make sure uh, that the, the treatment uh, is, is not very different from banks. Otherwise, we would simply have a transfer of risk uh, from, from the banks to the insurance. By the way, with a big risk, uh, that credit is not priced correctly. So uh, what is the non-performing loans problems with insurance? Then I, I would like to, to thank you for your patience, and I, I'm passing the floor to Dimitris. Thank you, Francesco. I think at this point we also have uh, a first poll question which is, uh, what is the, what is the view of the participants when it comes to the need of a macro prudential framework in insurance in addition to the already existing micro prudential one now uh, perhaps taking over from what francesco was mentioning before he mentioned several items and several areas where why a micro, macro prudential framework may be needed but against uh, to the to the basic rationale here is to have a framework in place when things go wrong and when things go wrong not 
for one institution alone, but for, let's say, for a, a good number of uh, small institutions or for a few large institutions. So a framework to have in place when things go wrong makes sense also when there are factors that they affect the industry as a whole. Uh, we will try to take a look at how the framework, how the environment is today. So what is the environment that the insurance sector is operating today? And we took some parts of this uh, framework and we focused a bit here now on the market risk, so the financial market. On the left hand side, uh, we bring what is uh, what the euro, the swap uh, curve, so what is used by the insurance sector as the starting point to value the liabilities. It is probably the best reflection of what we call the low yield uh, environment. So what does it mean, low yields? And I think it's a very good picture to see also the, the path of the curve. Perhaps it is visible the top green curve, uh, which is at December 2005, that now serves like a ceiling to this uh, chart. But indeed, in December 2015, we were already discussing uh, the low yield environment. The low yield environment. Uh, at the bottom, we saw the yields of June 2019. Uh, with a good part of the curve being in negative territory, now we know that the biggest part of the curve is in negative territory, so we're not really discussing low yields, we're discussing negative yields. And this has, of course, an impact for the liability side of the sector, but not only, of course, also on the asset side, which is, uh, let's say, composed mainly of marketable assets. Francesco spoke already on the search for yield. Uh, the impact of the search for yield, of course, is reflected on market uh, prices. Part of these market prices comes to you here on the right-hand side, which is uh, the corporate bond spreads. You do, see, you do see the narrowing of uh, the spreads, but uh, let's say corporate bond spreads is only part of the picture. Equity markets are quite high levels. We all know that the government bond yields are at extremely low and negative uh, levels in most cases, not uh, significantly different to, to what we see at the euro swap uh, uh, curve, at least when it comes to the euro area. So this creates an environment that on one hand side your liabilities are at quite high levels, on the other side your assets are also at quite high levels, but also with an increased risk of mispricing. So the question that comes to everyone's mind is, is this environment sustainable? And is the, are these yields sustainable? This market price sustainable? And if yes, for how long? And if not, what's going to happen when the market conditions uh, change? So we said that the environment affects the assets, the liabilities, but of course it affects also the profitability, the income stream and the cost. Uh, of course, and especially here, we brought something that affects mainly life business. When it comes to the income stream, of course, you have the interest income, you have other income, but also you have uh, the costs that uh, when it comes to certain life products are uh, mainly take the form of the current guarantees. On the left hand side, not entirely visible, but probably in printed versions, uh, we hope it is uh, more visible. You see the, the period for which interest rate guarantees are expected to apply. So you do understand that the problem is not the necessarily the guarantees that they are given today for going forward, but also what comes from the backlog. This is even better visible, we can see it even better when we take a look at the right hand side. Here we see the levels of guarantees already provided. So what you would see on the blue column per country, because also there are significant differences per country, it's always good to take a look at that. I will use, a, uh, I think it's a favorite phrase of Francesco that I'm borrowing on occasion, which is on average we're all healthy, but uh, you also need to take a look sometimes at the differences that uh, they take place uh, from uh, country to country, sometimes on an individual basis. Here you may see the differences, as I mentioned, from country to country, but also the differences to what we say to the backlog, so to the product that they are ongoing. Some of them are not being offered uh, yet now. Uh, and that's the blue columns. Nonetheless, you need to honor these promises. And you see sometimes extremely high levels of yields. Co when com compared to today's yields, not compared to the yields that they were prevailing at the time these guarantees were provided. But you also see the effort that's been taken and from the industry, but sometimes also from the at the national level to lower the level of uh, guarantees provided. Uh, so this is a visual way to present also the challenges faced by the sector also at the profitability level. Uh, this does not only apply a couple of bad years going forward. This may be reflected also 
to solvency levels, but of course, it, you also do not want a sector that is not profitable, because a sector that is not profitable is a sector that cannot attract capital when capital is needed. So the low yield environment, as we say, uh, affects the sector in multiple uh, ways. How do we make an effort to estimate the impact? Yes, of course, as IOPA here, we run stress test exercises, try to uh, assess the impact, at least at the European level. In the last exercise that we've done at the end of, in 2018, uh, we had two scenarios, what we call the yields up and the yields down scenario. The yields up reflect the situation where there, are increased, there is increased risk premia, so the, the main impact came from your asset side. The yields down scenario, much, it's a scenario much like what we are uh, looking at today. Uh, that is a scenario that yields are going uh, at lower and lower uh, levels, even affect, uh, affecting the so-called UFR. You would see uh, the results, at, uh, let's say, presented here at the right hand side. Starting from good levels, the blue columns that you see in this chart is the what we call baseline scenario, but we mean the pre-stress pre scenario, a sector that uh, capturing 75% market coverage, so the 42 major European groups. Uh, it's well capitalized, uh, starting from good levels. Nonetheless, you see that under these stress conditions, you would have a good number, when especially when you see that percentages and market share, the number is uh, becoming significant. A good number of firms that, that they may go below 100% uh, SCR or around the 100% uh, SCR. Uh, so this could have an impact in the financial stability, and those, so this is an area to be looked uh, into. So we say that the risk of uh, the prolonged low yield uh, environment increases the concerns for the solvency. Uh, we need to be uh, cautious of the measures uh, used to to, to assess uh, the, the technical provisions and the liabilities of uh, insurers. There are efforts taking that uh, direction. Already there was, from AOPA, a methodology provided for the UFR, so not to have a static <coughs> and fixed UFR, but something that is uh, more or less uh, related to market conditions. There are efforts also ongoing now as part of the solvency to review mentioned by, from uh, Francesco <laughs> to see uh, other, other elements of the framework that can be more uh, close to market conditions. But of course, some of the proposals already mentioned uh, to you, recovery <laughs> resolution, uh, liquidity risk, uh, some intervention powers that they may need uh, to be in place. But of course, and also that already part of the framework, but they need perhaps to enhance it, building capital in good times that you can release it in uh, bad times. So this would, uh, we will focus now in two of these elements. We will take a deeper look in the recovery resolution and in uh, insurance guarantee schemes. Starting from recovery and resolution, uh, here it's not entirely new. Uh, as, as in the macro pro framework, both institutions, NAO and ESRB, we published uh, an opinion and a report uh, respectively, trying to address the issue and coming up with uh, proposals. We call for a minimum degree of uh, harmonization. and flagging the issue that the lack of harmonization makes cross-border cooperation and coordination more difficult and the implication this may have and this does have for the internal uh, market. Now, we are not in this area, we are not necessarily proposing new tools. So it's not like the macro proof framework that we are proposing new tools or enhancement of existing tools. Here, the focus is in the need for harmonization. Francesco already mentioned the developments in several uh, countries. Other tools exist partly in uh, countries or in other countries than the ones uh, Francesco <coughs> mentioned before. So here we're also addressing the, the, the need for harmonization and the need to not to have national solutions that later will create a problem on their own when uh, uh, dealing with cross-border uh, uh, issues. So what we call here a patchwork of national rules cannot be sustainable uh, going uh, forward. This is also part of the call for advice, so this is also part of what we say the 2020 review and is currently under uh, discussions here in EOPA to submit a proposal specific on this topic to the Commission. Now, this uh, proposal composes of uh, what we call uh, certain building blocks, which we will present in the next slide, assuming that it works because somehow it does not proceed now. Yep. Yes. Yes. Here we go. I pressed it ten times, so at least it only <laughs> we only moved one slide. Uh, so here we present, let's say, in one uh, glance, the whole uh, framework. We used uh, what I mentioned before, the so-called building blocks. Building blocks because not all elements of the framework need to be uh, completely aligned. So 
to the, there is a certain degree of, of degree of flexibility and to the different parts of the framework, but also to the uh, to the parts of the framework that will be that they may be implemented differently from in different jurisdictions. So I will run uh, quite quickly through the proposal, uh, which has certain elements, preparation and planning, early intervention. With recovery here, we say uh, it's the shaded area, the recovery. We, this is the part already included in solving. So this is the part that already takes place after the breach of uh, SCR. This is already covered and this is excluded from the proposal we will put forward now. And past the recovery phase, uh, when you go into steps that they are a bit more closer to default, which is the resolution. And of course, elements on uh, cooperation. So what are the building blocks of each of these uh, items? In the area of preparation and planning, again, not entirely new concepts. Preemptive recovery plan, resolution planning and resolvability assessment so is the structure of an institution such that it will be it will be easy to be resolved in a in a in a way that does not prohibit uh, finance that does not pose threat to finance stability or policy holders early intervention other tools in place uh, that can help supervisors intervene at an early stage not necessarily <coughs> with uh, let's say, completely intrusive powers but they can intervene at an early stage to to assist perhaps Perhaps even the institution itself uh, not to breach its SCR. Then it's the level, as we said, the breach of SCR. And then it is the concept of uh, resolution. The concept of resolution, which is something between business as usual and uh, gone concern. The resolution is an effort that will try to prevent uh, a disorderly failure of uh, an institution. The need for resolution uh, authority, the objectives, we will have a question on uh, the objectives. And finally, very important important, the need to have cross-border cooperation, parts of it covered already from uh, current uh, CM, the crisis management groups, but the need to enhance this even further. If I'm not mistaken, at this point we have a second poll question, which relates to the objective of uh, resolution. This is something very interesting also when we're discussing the two institutions among us. AOPA as a micro-prudential uh, institution is more focused on consumer uh, protection. So, for us, a good, very good trigger of a resolution could be uh, consumer protection. For uh, institutions, macro potential institutions like the ESRB, the main goal could or should be uh, financial stability, but it could be a combination of uh, both, and that's something that we would uh, put now for you, for all of your view in this uh, poll question. So, concluding on this area, we may say that Proportionality is key, indeed, it's easy to say, but uh, this is something that needs to be implemented, especially in a framework like that. You can, of course, all insurance, and we had this in the previous slide, all insurance are within the scope, but you cannot expect from all insurers uh, to, to submit, uh, for example, a recovery plan. Uh, you cannot expect the same from uh, AXA or from a small insurer operating in a small country like the one that I come from, like Greece. So proportionality can take and can take many forms. Sometimes what we call a waiver, if there, if there are reasons to, uh, for the supervisor to think that there is not a necessity for some rules to apply, or some simplifications, well, this is the preferred options, at least on our side, perhaps the simplification when it comes to how you apply these uh, measures, so you would not expect a very thorough recovery plan for a very small uh, insurer somewhere in Europe. Uh, other elements, the, the toolkit of the resolution, cooperation and coordination, and one of the issues that we want uh, to, uh, to, let's say, strengthen are this resolution toolkit. We also have the restructuring of liabilities as one of the potential measures. It is applicable already in some uh, countries. We would like to see this, if available, but available under very strict, uh, let's say, uh, safeguards. You cannot be, perhaps, I'm using an example here, it is not desirable to allow a restructure of the liability without for, uh, dealing, first of all, with the management that uh, led the insurer to failure. So th there are some, let's say, safeguards that there need to be in place when taking so drastic uh, measures. And finally, uh, that will serve as a bridge to the next and final part of the presentation, we have the non-creditor worth of uh, principle, which means that for the resolution as a concept to make sense, it needs to be that the policyholder will, will be compensated more than in case of uh, failure, in case of uh, default. And for this principle to be applied, for the non-credit worse off, also the concept 
concept of IGS uh, enters the discussion because indeed in several countries uh, there is a compensation uh, taken uh, by the policyholders in cases of insurance failures. But as we know or and as we saw when we initiated the work in insurance guarantee schemes, this protection is not offered in the same level across the union and this is one of the most important things and the most sensitive things we know when, when that uh, we need to deal with in this uh, area. So insurance guarantee schemes, there are significant differences. We took, careful, uh, we took careful steps when we started uh, doing this work. We took stock of what is in place. We saw significant differences, uh, scope of coverage, the way the funding uh, is uh, handled, but also when it comes to the functionality and the, sometimes the legal for, uh, form of an IGS. There is significant fragmentation. This is particularly a problem when it comes to cross-border business, especially insurance, and especially when you aim at the European level at a common market. Cross-border business is significant significant part of uh, the business and this becomes the, the lack of cons some kind of harmonization on IGS creates specific issues with real life examples uh, that we also that also have seen the light of day uh, during 2018 it creates significant differences in the way policyholders are protected in different parts of uh, the union as part of the 2020 review, AOP has consulted and we on the what we call an advice on the harmonization of uh, national uh, IGSs. Uh, and here, what we will propose is, uh, let's say, a minimum harmonization. And we try to and we focus in the areas of uh, the role and the functioning. Geographical coverage by geographical coverage would not mean uh, countries or areas within Europe. We mean whether it's. Uh, going to be what we call a home or home or host based approach so who will bear the responsibility to compensate the policyholders in case of failures and uh, our proposal would be uh, to be managed mainly in cases of failure where the risk is and where the supervision is done so a home based approach what would be the eligible policies uh, the eligible claimants what is the coverage level is there a specific percentage below which you shouldn't go how do you ensure funding uh, how do you ensure disclosure of the fact that, for example, in different parts of the Union, there are different levels of protection uh, offered? And again, uh, cross-border cooperation of, and coordination, which is uh, significant to, uh, to cross-border business, but not only, because don't forget, also large groups have subsidiaries throughout the Union, and these subsidiaries offer different levels of uh, protection to the policyholders sometimes for the same product. And with this, I think, we conclude there is a final uh, poll question that comes to the IGS and what are the views of the participants when it comes to the levels of harmonization or to the levels of uh, change uh, that we would propose in this area and I think now it's time for us to pass the floor to you for uh, perhaps to discuss the results of the poll questions and re or to or receive any new questions. Thank you very much. Let's give just a few more seconds to our participants participants to fill in the form and the poll and see uh, how the trend is. And once this is done, what we'll do is that we will also publish all the poll results on the chat box so that perhaps towards the end of the of the discussion and of the Q&A we will review the results of the of the various polls. So just a few more seconds and then we'll change the environment and make sure that you can type in your questions or comments. Thanks a lot, uh, Dimitris and Francesco, for the very insightful presentation. I think it's uh, interesting to see the parallels with banking, but also what, what makes insurance specific. You didn't mention, if I'm recording correctly, uh, the reality of reinsurance uh, groups. Is that something that you're that you're looking at too in in some way, or is it something that you deliberately wanted not to talk about today? Want to something from that? No, now? I mean in, in general we are looking at reinsurance as as a part of the same business. We are of course aware that reinsurance is very international. Uh, one of the questions, which of course is very much also in, uh, in our minds is also the, the need to have a level playing field. There are also discussions which are going on at the international level on this. Uh, but basically we see uh, reinsurance as part of the questions which we have to solve. Reinsurance could be also, to a certain extent, 
it, they could for contagion in the sense that, of course, our insurance is very diversified, and the insurers are based on the fact that they are able very much to diversify their activity. They are doing quite well. Uh, but of course, if the reinsurers were going into great difficulty, this would spread the problems to all its clients, which are uh, which are insurers. More or less the same on on our side. So actually, our proposals in both recovery resolution and just address the whole scope of application of solvency too. So also including uh, reinsurance. And uh, whenever we need to explain sometimes the specificities of the of reinsurers so when it comes to the rationale for application yeah. or when it comes to specific tools we try to make this to, to the extent possible clear in our uh, opinion or our technical advice okay the second question i had then giving a bit more time also to our participant to formulate their uh, thoughts and, and questions was about the uh, you talked about the recovery and resolution schemes and the um, deposit guarantee schemes in europe if you look at what's happening also in the rest of the world, uh, because there are several participants also here today from outside of Europe, do you see that Europe is going uh, alone in, in one direction and the others are doing something else? Or what, could you just share your thoughts about what's going on also from a broader international uh, perspective and how, how Europe fares in that sense? I, I can say perhaps a few words on that um, at the EOPA site, but of course also aligned with the ESRB because most of this work we do in parallel. And we are participating in the IIS uh, discussions. Currently the IIS, so the International Association of Insurance Providers, are discussing the so-called holistic framework for the assessment of systemic risk in insurance. Okay. Uh, there has been already a consultation paper. At the U it's almost now close to finalize with the final proposal, let's say. You will recognize a lot of common elements of the European proposal to the international proposal. So most of the items, if not all that we discussed here today, of course the IGS is a separate item, so it, that it's not part of a framework for a systemic risk. But every, the tools that Francesco mentioned when it comes to macroprudential policy, recovery resolution, you will see these uh, notions also in the international uh, level. I may add one point. So, in some in some constituencies, like for instance in the United States, some of these issues have been really uh, discussed fiercely, and uh, not only under Trump but already under under Obama. And one thing which we have been able to to do in Europe, on the contrary, is to keep the supervisory community together. In the U United States, uh, the, the litigation among uh, the, the supervisors, the micro, the macro, uh, the national and the federal has been enormous. Okay. And uh, so one of the things which we achieved is uh, that on this side of the Atlantic we have been staying together. Okay. Great. So we have two questions. Let us start maybe with Leticia's question. Who says, in today's digital environment full of tech disruptors, especially in the fintech side, do you see any need to bring in more regulation for those companies providing cyber insurance? How would you see this affecting the insurance markets from a risk point of view, a potential of next bubble? Uh, I don't yeah. know if Dimitris uh, or Francesco you want to. Dimitris. I'll say a couple of words, but I also know that the ESRB is working on cyber quite uh, extensively. From focusing only on the insurance side, of course, cyber we have the cyber risk as a cyber threat, as a threat to the financial institutions to the sector and that's something that uh, it's let's say perhaps uh, not as significant as the threat that the banking sector is facing but nonetheless a lot of uh, let's say sensitivity there especially when it comes to the data that the insurance that the insurers are uh, managing but of course they, they need not to have any what we call oper operational uh, dysfunction when it comes to the services provided by the sector when it comes to cyber insurance which that's mainly what this question is all about and the link to the digital economy we do see 
Uh, first of all, we do see the digital economy as an enabler of uh, economic growth. And in this context, we do see the pro cyber insurance perhaps as a facilitator of the digital uh, economy. Because indeed, together with cyber insurance, we don't know, we saw it together with the digital economy, we do know that cyber risk will become, cyber threat will become more and more important. This will go hand in hand. Yeah. So the need to have some kind of coverage for, his, uh, for this threat is there. Of course, uh, a business opportunity and, and, and an area of growth comes again with risks. And then it is also, of course, the, the duty of the supervisory community to address uh, these risks. We, we, we initiated work on this area. Information sharing, data sharing, there are basic elements still missing from, uh, from operations, from the real life as we are talking today. The proposals that we will, prepare to, we will prefer to start with are in this area uh, rather than this discussing regulation to, this, to such a, a new, let's say, a business opportunity that's still for the sector. But some basic elements like proper risk management, proper pricing and information sharing, the, these are prerequisites that we would expect to see. I, don't know, Francesco, if you I want wanted to, to add one point. One is a very macro, the other is very micro. The one which is very micro, so I'm invading a bit the territory, is that is also there will be the need to ensure consumer protection mm -hmm. because plenty of times you are signing a, a police and then when there is a problem uh, the insurer disappear okay so we know it from a lot of travel problems uh, so when you are traveling and you have a problem try to to get the insurance pay your your things it's uh, i mean uh, really you, you you have to to have a lot of luck okay so there is a there is an issue here the very macro thing is we should not underestimate the risk uh, that uh, issues of business continuity could become uh, a shock to the economy. Okay? There, can be a, there can be combinations, and we are looking at a, a lot of this, in which at a certain time something which starts as an episode which is affecting one crucial node of, of, of finance is then uh, spreading according, by the way, to contagion rules which are very different from the classical contagion rules. And certainly, insurance is, is one of the, the financial sector which is at risk, like, uh, like all the others. Okay. Thanks. Uh, second question by Stefania, um, who thanks for the lecture, so thanks, thanks to you. Uh, last August, she says, we received sad news about a possible default by GE as part of the Marco Polo's report, apparently, in particular on the life insurance sector. Right. If I understand the question correctly, and please, uh, Francesco, jump in. When it comes to the possible failure of failures uh, in general, we, we do say that we have solvency tool in place. We do have, we also in other parts of the world, there are different uh, prudential regimes, but failures do occur and will occur. So no, no regime in a zero failure regime. And that's, what we are, that's why we're discussing the issues we are discussing today. Because the key here is, of course, how, how is it possible to have as less as possible consumer detriment, uh, but also consumers should be aware and uh, well informed. And on the other side, if we're not discussing only one failure, but a series of failures, how do we prevent this becoming an issue for financial uh, stability and how to prevent this becoming an issue for the real economy? But none of the items we discussed today, but not none of the items that they were addressed when uh, the micro prudential framework were uh, designed, uh, leads to a zero failure regime. Failures will be part of uh, daily life, and sometimes it's even healthy to have failures because it makes uh, the market a bit more uh, efficient. When it comes to platforms, uh, if I understand again correctly, I will only talk about platforms of cooperation that I know we do have here in EOPA. And what we have, especially for cases that they are smaller uh, insurers, so not insurers that we, they have what we call the colleges of supervisors, so supervisors that they already have are in place uh, uh, for, for cooperation, but platforms that they bring together uh, for smaller cases, uh, insurers from different parts of uh, Europe, sometimes also of uh, the world. I just, uh, we, we were wondering also with uh, Francesco, if by GE you're Is talking general, about if, General Electric, speaking about would, general electric? perhaps it would be good if we could see a clarification on that because maybe it's something that we were not aware of but so yeah. i i would say if i hear uh, is is general electric which you're speaking about I, well, stefania I, is writing back uh, yeah. yes so yes g okay 
General Electric, okay. One, one interesting topic. So this is something which is not necessarily completely 100% linked to, to, to insurance, but this gives you also a sense of what we are saying. At this certain time, macroprudential policy will have to look at also at the question of possible propagation of prices from large corporates. And the questions of uh, excessive indebtedness of large corporates and also the positions of the large corporations in derivative, in derivative markets. So this, this is something which, of course, is, uh, we, should, we should look at. Having said that, to tell the truth, in the, we are not doing anything on this specific, uh, specific issue in, in, uh, in this moment. Okay. Thank you. So um, I think we can take a last question and then I would give you a chance if you agree to discuss the, the three poll results. So the last question is actually uh, referring to the search for yield and how um, if uh, you could explain again the mechanics of how the search for yield will affect the insurance sector uh, because Olger who is asking Miss part of the lecture and is asking whether you could explain that briefly again. Would that be okay by you? Yes, well, to a certain extent, if you look at, um, I would say something which can be erratical, so I hope uh, uh, people are I speak under the, con the control of everybody, but at a certain time, it's part of the job which insurance is doing on the asset side is not really very different from the one of, a, of an investor, which is basically like an investment, in my large investment fund and very investment industry. And these people have to decide uh, where, where to put the money. Now, the classic story which you hear normally from in insurance people is that they do it simply as a reflex of their liabilities. So they will say, our real, uh, our real job is to sign policies and to be active on the liability side. On the, on the asset side, what we are doing, we are simply matching uh, in order to make sure that there is no risk. Now, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Uh, and um, what you see is, of course, that there is some active uh, investment policy on the, the... Plus, of course, one of the implications of of monetary policy is, to a certain extent, that we are transmitting via uh, interest rate a very strong push uh, for insurance to, to, I mean, to diversify the, the investment of the traditional, traditional ones, which are, of course, all subject to some, some pressure. And I think the numbers which we are seeing are confirming it. So um, the, the insurance uh, uh, insurance is going more and more in uh, uh, corporate debt. Uh, insurance is traditionally investing enormously in sovereign and banks, uh, but insurance is going in, in corporate debt, and of course, insurance is trying to find yields. They, they, they need to do it to, to, to a certain extent. So, the, if you are getting out of the traditional idea that the uh, insurer is so to speak, a stupid, stupid investor, which is simply, uh, let's say, taking note of what is done uh, in another floor uh, and uh, investing at the maturity and uh, uh, which is necessary to match. And if you think at insurance as, uh, so to speak, the big, uh, let's say, manager of uh, liquidity, which w needs to be, uh, to be invested, it's obvious that these people have to to look in this situation, have to look for uh, for yields which are higher than average. Just uh, to, to add perhaps to what Francesco mentioned, we do notice some movement, some changes in the portfolio. We, you will see, for example, uh, what an increase in what we call uh, non-liquid, less liquid investments, so the search for uh, illiquidity premium, you will see some deterioration in the credit quality of the portfolio. So part of the search for yield is exactly that. But you will also see new investments. You will see the insurance in, in, uh, engaged more in direct uh, lending. So by definition, not necessarily all these are negative. Some parts are even desirable because that's what happens in the low yield environment and when the rates go down. What we call the negative 
part of the search for yield if, is if these activities do not correspond to the risk-bearing capacity of an institution. And the risk-bearing capacity is not only the capital in place to cover that risk, but also do you properly assess the risks. I think at the beginning you mentioned, Francesco, direct lending is fine. Perhaps it offers also diversification of your portfolio. As long as you do it properly, you have a credit team that is doing proper at the writing. So not everything is negative when we say search for yield. It becomes negative if it does not come with uh, proper uh, risk management. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, so we are already over time, but if you agree, what we could just do is to discuss one poll result uh, and engage with the with the various uh, results that you can observe. Uh, so if you look at the chat box, on top you have poll results 1, poll 2, and poll 3. Um, I don't know if you prefer to discuss poll 1, 2, or 3. Uh, I leave this to your discretion. Let's see the numbers to see if any of them is more, let's say, something. Uh, so I think the one, what we say, that I think both, right? The one, the vast majority calls for both micro and uh, yes. macro reasons. It makes sense. So one yeah. is, do you think there is a need for, for macro pressure? Macro. It's clear there is an yeah. overwhelming uh, majority in favor. Two, I think it's very balanced, which I think makes sense. Yeah. It makes sense is uh, this type of things. And uh, let, let me okay. see. We have to see the result of the post three. It's here, yes. Which is 68% for uh, main elements should be defined at EU level, leaving room for national discretion. Yeah. So, if I may comment only on the last one that has, let's say, the less uh, overwhelming yes. Nonetheless, what I'm surprised to see, which is still positive, is that there is one third of participants that they call for a higher level of harmonization than the one that we propose. Uh, sometimes, at least when discussing uh, with our colleagues at the national level, we get the sense that it is the opposite. There is the tendency sometimes to keep things as they are. So we are happy to see that the majority of the participants here, they would go for either a step forward in their harmonization or even a few steps even further when it comes to harmonizing national uh, regimes. I don't know if you would like well, to add anything for mean, any part it, of it. It means that the public which is uh, looking at us is a, is a European public, uh, which does not fear some elements of risk sharing where there is some confidence among uh, the, the colleagues and the friends who are uh, around, uh, around the table. Uh, we are part of that world, so we are uh, happy to, to meet this, uh, these colleagues. And uh, on the question, uh, one, one thing which I wanted to say uh, is, <clears throat> um, on another point, don't underestimate how important cross-border activity is for insurance. Mm -hmm. One thing which very few people know is that there is more cross-border insurance than cross-border banking. Uh, and this uh, means uh, that uh, this activity which we are doing and on which we are speaking also, for example, on recovery resolution is very material. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to really warmly thank you, uh, Francesco and Dimitris, for your time and energy dedication and to our participants for their, their questions. Um, there was one question we couldn't tackle, uh, but that's going to be for, uh, for the next uh, occasion. Um, should you be interested in delving more into the topic, you, you're really warmly invited to join our upcoming course on prudential risk in the, insur in the insurance sector to be held in Florence on 17 and 18 of October with ESRB, IOPA, and the National Bank of Belgium. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Dimitris and Francesco are going to be there as instructors too. Thank you.